of the UNIA, um, I think that number one, they had um, more than any other organization in the history of the United States. Um, it was the most successful African organization. It was far more successful when you look at the actual things they were able to accomplish. The UNIA in the short time that it existed was able to launch a newspaper. They were able to buy several ships. They were able to really capture the minds and the hearts of black America and in a time that we were coming out of a philosophy of essentially assimilation, you know, that was what black liberation looked like. No one, um, there were there were previous people who were Pan-Africanists who did point to going back to Africa, but overwhelmingly the dialogue at the time, especially following um, uh, Booker T. Washington's success, the the dialogue and the and the talk at the time was more so trying to get along without being so um, aggressive. And so the UNIA kind of took a really different path and their path was to say that we're not going to try to emulate wh white society. We're going to more so look to Africa and we're going to build our own institutions. We're not gonna try to integrate into the white man's institutions. So just from that standpoint, to me, they came in with a very strong philosophy and they really did capture the minds of Africans throughout not just the United States, but throughout the world. For that reason, I would say that more than any other organization that we're probably going to discuss today, I believe that the UNIA is probably the most successful just because of the effect that Marcus Garvey was able to have on Pan-Africanism long after he's been uh, passed away. As far as the issues that um, might, might have led to the organization's demise, so from my perspective, I think that number one, uh, Marcus Garvey, while he was a very great man, he also was not someone who, he was someone that tried to take on everything on his own. And he did not necessarily delegate responsibilities in the organization, um, more so um, were areas where he didn't have expertise, for example, a lot of the ships that were purchased by the UNIA turned out to be um, basically not not well crafted or very old. They were not able to do a lot with the ships, for example. There are just different areas whenever you read about the organization where because he was not able to delegate responsibilities to people who had certain expertise, um, the organization didn't do as well as it could have done. Um, I think the other thing, and this is something I'm sure we're gonna see as a theme in a lot of black organizations is that the personality of the person leading the organization overshadows the organization. And when that person is no longer present, the organization fades. That's like a common theme with our liberation movements. You'll have one person that's the star, so to speak. And whenever that person's no longer there, they could be assassinated. In Marcus Garvey's case, he was deported. Whatever happens, um, essentially there's a void. You know, so that, that that was a need to me. There was a need to me for him to cultivate people to step in if he was taken out. So, you know, those are just my perspectives. I'm sure you guys will have a lot more um, to add to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say I agree with that 100 percent. And I think that was the main issue with the UNIA is that Garvey was such a um, such a powerful personality that he kind of um, overshadowed everyone else within the organization. So what happened was when he was deported from the United States, the organization uh, weakened in the United States without him. But when he went back to Jamaica, went back to the Caribbean, was organizing the UNIA in the Caribbean, it was still very strong there because Garvey was there to build the movement. And then ultimately what happened was when Garvey died, the organization, the UNIA itself, you know, kind of faded in um, influence. And there are multiple different um, groups claiming to be the true successor of Marcus Garvey. There, you know, there's multiple different um, branches of the UNIA, but the UNIA has never really been able to uh, recapture the, the influence and the strength that it had in Garvey's time. And I think it's a testament to what Garvey's doing that even though his organization wasn't as influential after his, he passed, his ideas were very influential. And just about any Pan-African leader that you can name who came after Garvey, whether it was Kwame Nkrumah, um, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, um, Walt Rani, you know, all across the diaspora, all across the continent, all of those leaders were influenced by Garvey in some way. A lot of people don't even realize Mark, Mark Luther King looked to Garvey in some sense um, as a source of influence. So Garvey as an individual influenced many different organizations and uh, leaders that came after him. But I think if you look at the UNIA as an organization, the great weakness is that because so much of it was centered around the personality of Garvey that it, you know, it, um, it diminished in influence when Garvey wasn't around. And that, that is a common theme, uh, theme that we say throughout um, 
black organizations, including some of the organizations that we'll be speaking about. But um, we we sought we sought out to the Nation of Islam when Elijah Muhammad died. The Nation of Islam fell apart, and there's different branches of the Nation of Islam now. W- one of which you know Farrakhan runs, but there's different branches. So just throughout our history, we see a recurring theme of when an individual leader dies, the organization either breaks up or it's no longer as effective. And I think the UNIA is probably the first example where we see that happening. You know, what's so amazing about the UNIA, it is the largest mass movement of black people in the history of the diaspora, if not of, if not the world, you know, I say at least in recent history, you know, with, within the last 100 years. You know, they said they had an estimated 13 million people worldwide, you know, with America having, having the strongest tie. They said that his um, newspaper paper, I believe it was Negro World, was so powerful that if if it was caught, if a person in Africa was caught with it, they would be killed. You know, one thing I find amazing is, even though Marcus Garvey wasn't that long ago, he was wiped out the history books. Despite having an estimated 13 million people, you know, a lot of our kids, a lot of our elders don't even know who we are who he is. I had to learn about him when I first went to college. You know, I didn't, re- I didn't hear about him in the, the traditional K through 12. You know, so I think it speaks volume to the power that he had that they kind of wiped him out because they knew the influence in which he had among our people. And this is why you look at the NOI, how they kind of copy his practices. You know, the only main difference was that they added Islam, you know, and made it more of a religious base. But, you know, a lot of the people within a, uh, the NOI organization at the time, you know, back in, in uh, um, Elijah Muhammad time, you know, credited um, um, Marcus Garvey for the for the inspiration. Even they used to have Marcus Garvey Day within the NOI. So that speaks volume to the work that he was doing. 